Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and this is Reality Asserts Itself. We're continuing our interview series about Venezuela, and we're joined again by our guest, Edgardo Lander. He's a sociologist and professor at the Central University of Venezuela in Caracas. He's one of the main organizers of the World Social Forum in 2006, which took place in, in Caracas. He holds a degree in sociology from the Universidad Central de Venezuela in Caracas and an MA and PhD in sociology from Harvard University. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Paul. So in 73, uh, Perez comes to power. In 1973, Carlos Andres Perez becomes the third president elected from Acción Democrática. There have been two presidents from Acción Democrática, then Caldera, who was a Christian Democrat, and then Carlos Andres Perez, who was sort of a, a new generation in Acción Democrática. But it so happened that oil prices increased to such an extent that same year that the national budget was multiplied by four from one year to another. This is, this is the war, the 73 war, and the Arab countries decide yeah. they're not going to send as much oil to the West. Yeah. And as a consequence, there's a sort of cultural transformation in Venezuelan society. This notion that Venezuela is a rich country that has got this incredible abundance of oil and oil prices are going to continue to increase and increase forever. So the government starts to invest massively in infrastructure and new industries and salaries go, uh, are increased all over the place. There's full employment. I mean, there's, there's a sort of dynamic of massive increase of consumption. This doesn't spread to the whole of the Venezuelan situation. It's, of course, it's more concentrated on, on the upper middle classes. But the whole culture, the whole notion that this is a rich country that's going to become richer and richer does spread to the whole of the population. Now, Perez nationalizes the oil company. I have to see here correctly, he nationalized iron. Uh, what, what's, that couldn't have been so favorably received by the U.S.? Well, the nationalization of the oil company was really a negotiated a negotiation. Since in Venezuela, as I, as I said before, um, oil belongs to the state. It's never given over to the companies, but it's the right to explore oil for a certain amount of time, for 20 years, for 30 years, or whatever. But after that, it stops. I mean, they have to renegotiate the whole thing. And most of the major fields were now getting to a point where they would return to the state. So the, there was a negotiation for the nationalization, so-called, when it was close to the moment where the oil fields were going to become state property again. So it wasn't the big confrontation. It wasn't. And there were contracts signed for technological and financial support, so full sorts that really allowed for the oil companies to continue working in the country. So this wasn't mm -hmm. seen as a challenge to no. either the oil companies or the United States? No, not really, not really. The fact that oil becomes such a huge part of the Venezuelan economy means that it became part of Venezuelan society and Venezuelan politics and the Venezuelan state. As more and more income came in from oil, many things happened to Venezuelan society. There was mass migration to the cities. There was an abandonment of agriculture in general. From the very beginning of oil exploitation, <clears throat> the Venezuelan currency became overpriced. As a consequence, Venezuela had what was later called the Dutch disease, but much before the Dutch ever had it, which meant that as a consequence of the currency exchange rate, it, was, it has been for almost a century now cheaper to buy things from abroad than to produce them nationally. And it's hardly possible to produce anything in Venezuela apart from oil that can be sold out of Venezuela because of the exchange rate. So this overvalued currency sort of transformed the whole productive apparatus in Venezuela. Venezuela was an agricultural country that lived basically of exporting agricultural products, uh, cocoa and then coffee, and, uh, completely uh, sort of displaced these activities in, for oil. But at the same time, there was a huge change in the political system because the transition to democracy meant 
that the parties that were created in this transition to democracy, especially after 1958, were parties that were basically state parties. Parties that were sort of going between state and the population. People voted for parties in terms of how the oil income was going to be distributed and what each party offered from the state. And so the whole political system became absolutely state-centered, but oil-centered. And at the same time, there was a rentier culture that was sort of deeply entrenched in Venezuelan society, which is this idea that since we're a rich country, since we have that much oil, since we deserve to have free oil, free gas, because it's our, this sort of a whole culture of rights. And this led to a very sort of corrupt political system because the people who had the means to distribute in one direction or another had enormous power and an enormous amount of possibilities of, of corruption. But at the same time, the oil distribution that came from the state meant that even the sectors of the economy that prospered, manufacturing industry, imports, et cetera, were successful to the extent that were subsidized by the state. So we had a sort of a state-created national bourgeoisie <laughs> because it depended on subsidies of all sorts by, by the state. And so it led to a situation, and that's part of the problem of Venezuelan society today, in which there was hardly a single area of Venezuelan society that was autonomous from the state. It was autonomous? Yeah. Everything was sort of in some way linked to the state or dependent on the state. And these parties managed, especially these two main parties, and especially Acción Democratic, the Social Democratic Party, managed to sort of extend their grips to the whole of Venezuelan society as intermediates between the state and society. Which, what, is, which is all about everybody trying to get some either yeah. lion's share or a trickle of the oil. Oh, yeah, yeah. In Venezuela, during that period after 1958, no matter where you looked, this presence of these two parties sort of distributing the spoils was, was there. When I was in high school and we had elections, there were sort of the candidates from Acción Democrática, the candidates from the Christian Democrats, and the Communists. But if there was an election of the president of the uh, National Symphony Orchestra, the candidates were from Acción Democrática or Coupe. And if there was a social club, same thing. So it was like the whole country was sort of, sort of under the wings of, of this Type of political system, and you make a you uh, make a choice who you're going to which party you're going to be allied with because yeah. I know someone mm -hmm. who knows someone who yeah. can get you a job or get yeah. you something a contract yeah. or yeah. something. But as a consequence, uh, the sort of the creation of networks of so-called civil society, a world that in Venezuela has a different meaning than in other parts of the world, uh, was really very weak. There weren't very many types of grassroots associations that were autonomous from the state. And this has enormous consequences in terms of how the political system works. So in 89, what happens? This whole system was based on high oil income and redistribution. And the fact that Acción Democrática basically also could pay, but Acción Democrática was really to some extent, a national popular party, which means that it was widely, widely covered the country. In Venezuela, when you, and people used to say that if you went to the smallest village, you would find the Acción Democrática House and the House of Polar, which is the main beer producer. Those were the two sort of things that were common across the country. These parties had sort of a party structure. They had local assemblies and they had weekly meetings of their membership. I mean, they were 
national popular parties that really existed as such. So in 1989, there's a there's the Caracazzo protests. What, what were that? What was that about, and, and what happened? In the years previous to the Caracazzo, there had been a sort of progressive deterioration of the legitimacy of the democratic system in Venezuela. There was more corruption. The parties had been transformed from national grassroots organizations with people participating as a party to just sort of electoral elites that competed just on television, nothing much more. But apart from that, for Venezuela, the due to the central role of oil, the, instead of the <clears throat> income per capita, you get a better idea of what the situation in Venezuela is like by distributing oil income per capita. And that had been going down for quite a while. So less legitimate parties, a serious economic situation in which the price of oil had gone down, a national debt, and pressures from international uh, financial institutions to adopt uh, adjustment policies. Carlos Andres Perez was elected for the second time offering expansive economic policies, offering full employment, offering sort of a new era of Venezuela as a rich country, Saudi Venezuela. Which meant government spending, stimulus, jobs yeah, programs. Yeah, yeah, and subsidies. But a week after he was elected, he signed this agreement with the International Monetary Fund to carry out a whole set of adjustment policies corresponding to the whole agenda of the Washington Consensus. Which is the opposite of Absolutely jobs the opposite. and social safety net Absolute, and all the rest. <clears throat> Absolutely the opposite of what he had offered. Amongst that, an increase of, significant increase in the price of gas which led to the increase in the price of public transportation. And that set up the sort of the initial movements that led to the, to the Caracaso. The Caracaso was the most widespread popular sort of revolt in Venezuelan history in terms of how it sort of worked out. It had no leadership. It was just sort of, sort of a popular spontaneous reaction, which was sort of magnified by the, by the media. And for two or three days, all the major cities in the country were sort of mobbed by people who were assaulting supermarkets and then distributors of all sorts of other stuff. And after three days, the government decided to take out the army and just kill who was on the way. I mean, it was a, the most massive repression ever. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people were killed. And that was like the coup for the, for the democratic legitimacy of the whole period in Venezuela. That was the end of it. After that, it was obvious that this was an completely illegitimate, not government, but system. And one of the people watching this uh, uh, was uh, Hugo Chavez, who was in the army. He and was sent out to repress people. He was sent out. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. And, and he confronted the fact that his orders were to, to repress or kill. That had a huge impact on his vision of Venezuela and the role of the military. And it's only, uh, uh, what, three, three years later? Yeah. That he's in, 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 in the, the a coup has come to the conclusion the government is so illegitimate mm, yeah. that he would uh, try to form a coup, yeah. organize a coup out of the armed forces, and it fails. Yeah. He had been organizing within the armed forces with some connection with part of the left in this sort of very nationalist vision of, of the things that had to be changed in Venezuela from some time before. But he was basically unknown. I mean, he was a colonel in the army, and nobody knew who the hell he was. When he came on television that night after the coup, and it was the sort of first time most of Venezuelans were exposed to him. So we'll pick this story up with Hugo Chavez and the Hugo, beginning of the Hugo Chavez era of Venezuelan history with Edgardo Lander, and on reality asserts itself on the Real News Network.